The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning. I know you guys are expecting me to come up here and say something funny, but I came up short. <laughs> and I will, uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave short too. <laughs> we have a serious subject to talk about this morning as we talk about the great I Ams in Scripture. I have the daunting task this morning of talking about the resurrection and the life. I want to do that, but first I want to go to prayer. So you would bow your heads with me as we pray. (coughs) Great Father in heaven, I come before you humbled at your word this morning. It's my prayer that you would use your word this morning. In spite of this dead manuscript that I've produced, in spite of the inadequate notes that I could put together, Father, I know that it is you and your spirit that can change and to give life and to comfort and to convict. So, Father, I rely on you solely this morning. Let your spirit fill this place. Let us think seriously about the subject before us. We thank you that you have brought us here on this morning with these people to worship you. Father, I pray that you would open up hearts this morning that you would open up my heart this morning. That you might take the knife that is your gospel and pierce hearts. And then bind them up in love with what you've done for this world. And I pray these things in the name of your Son, our faithful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I was originally going to tell you to open up your Bibles to Genesis 1 and put your finger there and then go to Revelation and put your finger there and we would be somewhere in between. Because really that's the story of the Bible. We just have it amplified for us here this morning in John 11. So if you would, open up your Bibles to John 11. And while you're doing that, the world, in case you haven't noticed this lately, is full of loss and sorrow and grief, and death, and illness. Even this morning, I don't know about you, but I woke up to the news that another mass shooting had taken place late last night in Texas, where two people at least have died. I haven't heard updated numbers since I looked this morning. But even as I look into this room, I can see, and I know everyone in here at some point or another has been affected by death. the death of a loved one, the death of a friend. Perhaps even now, even as Nick prayed for our brother Kirk, we're battling cancers and illnesses, or we know somebody who is. And if we let it, it can discourage us. So that's the trick, is not letting it discourage us? And how do we do that? How do we respond to such things, such a world? How do we engage in a world of such sorrow? We might ask the question first, why? That's why I asked Nick to read Genesis 3 this morning. I was only half joking about starting in Genesis because that's where the story starts. We have the answer to this. After the creation of man, the Lord God, we read this, took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of any tree in the garden, 
But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Not if, but when. Paul explains that in Romans 5 this way, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And so when we're tempted to take a look at sin in whatever form that it is, and we want to think lightly of it, I urge you to think about our brother Kirk and about people that you know that have died and realize that sin has caused the problem. So this morning, I'm going to take you through John 11, narrative style. Now, that's not a commentary on the fact that I don't think topical sermons are the way to go. It's more of a word that I just stink at topical sermons, Okay? So open up to John 11. See, the Gospel of John is a book of signs. That's what we call it. And Jesus performed them specifically, he writes later on, so that people would believe in him. This book is about his identity being Jesus Christ, as the Messiah, as God. Now some people, I know you've heard this before, claim that Jesus never claimed to be God anywhere in the Bible. And I say those people have never read this Gospel. As Joel pointed out a couple weeks ago, in his I am, before Abraham was, I am. They knew exactly what he was saying. For not only is this gospel the book of signs, the signs themselves were continually pointing us to a person, the great ego, me, I am, the one identified as God. So our text this morning is John 11, particularly around verse 25, which says this, I am the resurrection, and the life. So then what is the significance, and I know we've heard this before in this series, of ego eimi, I am. Well, it's the equivalent of when God revealed his covenant name to Moses at the burning bush. And I urge you to read that chapter again because it's another hobby horse of mine, I won't get into it now, but read that chapter again and just see who it is that Moses is talking to. Now that sounds like we know who he's talking to, but just read it. Because that same person shows up this morning. Now, I can't go exhaustively through this chapter. There's no way I could. I'm not built for that. But the good news and the bad news is it's snowing this morning, and it was safe enough for you to get here. The bad news is it's supposed to get worse as we go on. So if this sermon turns south, you guys are stuck here. (laughs) But before we get to John 11, 25, I want to set the stage for us and what's going on in the book of John so far. So the ministry of Jesus has ramped up to the point where his opponents do not just view him as a flash-in-the-pan troublemaker or an inconvenient annoyance, but a blasphemer who threatens them. Notice in verse 3 of chapter 10, he says this, I and the Father are one. And immediately after that, immediately after that, the Jews pick up stones again to stone him. And so Jesus answers them there. He says this, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to kill me? And the Jesus answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. So Jesus has unmistakably, unashamedly said exactly what he wanted to say. And he has announced or proclaimed Not that he has made himself God, he has revealed himself as God. That he and the Father are one. So once again, they try to arrest him, and Jesus escapes along with the disciples. But it says this in verse 40. This is important. He went away again across the Jordan. That's where Jesus is at this point. So the Jews wanted to punish Jesus, not for what he did, but for what he said. They wanted to punish him with the ultimate punishment, which is death. But he escapes, and he's no longer in or around Jerusalem at this time. And that becomes key to the narrative this morning. I say this all the time, if you've heard me teach, you've heard me say this, that God doesn't give us useless information in the Bible. It's there for a reason. He recorded it for a reason. Even the smallest details are there for us to know, because he wants us to know them. And so when he says... He went away again across the Jordan. That's useful information. That is the opening to the story of John 11. So John 11 starts this way. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. 
It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love, whom you love, is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. That's the stage. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. These are the siblings that were so fond of him, and he of them. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in a place where he was. Now, the first thing I want to point out here again is where Jesus is is not where they were. Seems simple enough, but it's important. It says he stayed two days longer in a place where he was. They had to send to him. And where he was, as we read a minute ago from John 10, was across the Jordan where John had been baptizing. And there he remained. And so very early on, we see the beginning of Jesus having a plan. He was not in Bethany where these siblings lived. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's commonly thought and believed that the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus acted as Jesus' home base for his ministry at this time. He didn't have his own home, we know that, so he spent time with them. And we read in verse 5 that Jesus loved them, all three of them. He had spent a lot of time with them in their home. You know, when Jesus makes the claim to deity that he does back in chapter 10, the Jews want to kill him, he escapes, but not to this safe place, this home that he knows, but rather somewhere else for a reason. Again, look back at verse 3. It says, the sisters sent to him. They had to send to him because he wasn't there. So I want to go back to verse 5 for a second. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So this shows the bond that he had with them. And then we get to verse 6. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now when you read that, does it seem strange to you? Is that how you would treat friends whom you loved when they sent you saying, we need you, and you would just stay? See, the fortunate part of having chapter breaks and and verses in your Bible is we can find stuff. But the unfortunate part is it's not part of the original manuscripts. And so when you break it up by verses, you kind of lose the flow. And so really, there, should, there is no separation between 5 and 6. It should read this. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. It's all one thought. How could Jesus do such a thing? It's almost as if the Apostle John recorded verse 5. So in verse 6, we don't think that Jesus is a monster. Does it sound so callous? It's like John is saying, I want you to know that Jesus really did love them, so, that, so much so that when he heard his friend was sick, he did absolutely nothing. He stayed where he was. It's different than how we would react. So we missed the point. That little word, so, the connecting word, it's a conjunction. You remember that song, right, from school, Conjunction, Conjunction, which made my life really boring. But it's a connecting word. It's a very important little word because it joins or glues two of these words or phrases together. Thus, the so in our text holds the phrases together. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, that's not the response we would expect. If any other friend would have reacted like this, Mary and Martha would have unfriended him on Facebook like that. Jesus, Lazarus, is ill. Come quick. The one you love is barely clinging to life. But Jesus stays where he is. I want you to know and keep in mind that Mary and Martha didn't know how Jesus had responded. Okay, we have the benefit of reading the story all the way through, don't we? But when you think about it from Mary and Martha's perspective, they didn't know what he had said. They just sent to him saying, come, Lazarus is ill. They didn't know what he said. They didn't know that he said, this illness does not lead to death, it's for the glory of God. They didn't have that information. They didn't see his calmness. And much like Job, they weren't privy to the inside information, much like us today. 
So that's why that little Greek conjunction is important. Without it, Jesus doesn't seem to care. But the reason that he stayed where he was is because he does care. That's the point. Jesus' delay was motivated by love for this family. Jesus loved them, so he stayed away two days. So I thought, what if we thought about that in every instance in which we didn't understand what, why, how, or when God was doing something or in fact not doing anything? What a comfort that would bring to us if we remembered that. Now we love the story because we know how it ends. We love Job's story because we know how it ends. But put yourself again in, your, in their shoes. They didn't know. It was love that motivated Jesus staying away, but how was it love? I want you to think of the timing for a minute. Okay? Put on your thinking caps for a second. If you jump real quick to verse 17, you read, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So the sequence would be this. Day one, Jesus is given the news that Lazarus is ill. Day two, he stays where he is. Day three, he stays where he is. Day four, he comes back. What that means is that Lazarus mostly, most likely died the same day Jesus received the news that he was ill. Now, why do I tell you that about the week? Again, no useless information. Old Jewish beliefs believed or taught that the soul of a person would hover over the body of a dead person for three days, and I quote, this is what they wrote, intending to re-enter it, but as soon as it sees appearance change or decompos decomposition, it departs. In other words, at that point, after three days, death, according to the Jews, is irreversible. It was commonly taught. Jesus knew this. Basically, Jesus wanted everyone, including the sisters that he loved, to know that Lazarus was truly dead. Not mostly dead, not near dead, but dead dead. There would be no question of the deadness of Lazarus when he arrived. So we're told that Jesus loved them, so he delays two days. And why? He tells us, so that the Son of God would be glorified by what he was going to do. It's love for God to demonstrate his glory to mankind, isn't it? That's a loving thing that God does. And so verse 7 says, Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let's go to Judea again. Now, after Jesus has given Lazarus enough time to be really dead, he tells the disciples, okay, time to go. Now, we don't know exactly what the disciples were thinking, and it's always dangerous to speculate, but when Jesus initially heard the news about his friend, he stayed two days longer, and I suspect that the disciples thought it was a pretty good idea to stay away. That's why I brought up John 10. Remember, he had just been in Jerusalem, and they tried to kill him, and he escaped. So why wouldn't you stay? I don't think it's a good idea, Jesus. But listen to the response when he tells them they're going to Judea again. This bears it out. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Are you crazy? I know you love Lazarus, but not a good idea. But for Jesus, there's work that he has to do, isn't there? He gives them a lesson in verses 9 and 10. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Now sleep in scriptures often used as a metaphor for death. And, a note, and note the truth even in the details provided here. As one commentator pointed out, the contrast between the plural, our friend, died, and the I am going to awaken him is not accidental. Jesus alone is the resurrection and the life. He had work left to do while it was still light out, before he would die. Even there, though, the disciples misunderstand about what's going on. See verse 12, the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. What's the big deal? He's, he's fine. He needs rest. And that's the way that we treat death, isn't it? And our sin. It's fine. 
One night we were up in Bailey, Colorado at a relative's house. And it's dark there, for those of you who don't know, it's really dark there. And so as we were taking the kids out, I was teasing my youngest daughter, Charlotte. I said, hey, we've got to get to the van quick. There's wolves out here. Right? I know, I'm a terrible parent. Okay? I'm like, there's wolves out here. And I'm carrying in there, and I'm trying to act like I'm buckling her fast. And she looks at me, and she goes, we're fine. I said, what faith is that? And then I started thinking, maybe there are wolves out here. And I started buckling quickly and jumping in the van. But that's how we treat it. He's fine. He just needs some sleep. If he's fallen asleep, that's what he needs is rest. Why are we going to go wake him up? Let's not go through all the trouble of going back there in danger where they just tried to kill you so you can go wake up a friend who's sleeping. Let's not wake the poor guy up. But that's the world. We do everything that we can to avoid thinking about this subject. Everything we can do to, to not have to embrace it. A friend on the elder board told me one time as we were talking about this, he's like, I hate to break it to you, but one day you're going to die. Very encouraging. And yet, what if I told you that right now, in this very moment, that someone was out there hunting you right now, looking for you, an enemy of yours? Would you not be concerned? And that's exactly how the Bible describes death, because of what sin has done to the world. So we can't treat it in such a lazy fashion anymore. We see lost and fallen people, we see ourselves, and the thought is, ah, they're just a little sick. Give them enough time, give them enough programs, and they'll be okay. It's not that bad. We don't need Jesus to come and wake us up. We need to be left alone. That's what the world says. So Jesus corrects their misunderstanding. He says this, Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. So then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. Man, Jesus sounds like a jerk in this chapter, doesn't he? He doesn't come when he's sent, and he says, I'm glad I wasn't there. But why? So that you may believe. But let us go to him. Now see, the condition is far more severe than you guys have anticipated. Now you have to give the disciples a little bit of a break here. The last they heard, Lazarus was sick. And at that news, Jesus stayed where he was. So in their minds, they're probably thinking, okay, it's not that bad, because if it was, Jesus would have gone when he was sent, or when they sent to him. If their master had not immediately jumped up and gone, as soon as he heard the news, the situation must not have been that dire. But now he tells them, no, Lazarus is dead. He died. I don't know about you, but for me, that's the most solemn, sobering news in the world to receive, isn't it? And I know at some point in this room, a lot of us, many of us, most of us, the majority of us have experience that moment when you've heard that news. The phone call that a family member has died. A text from a friend about another mutual friend who's died. And sadly for some of us, it happens too often. Even when it's expected, even when you know that's the outcome, as soon as you hear the news, it sends that tingling feeling down your back because it's, it seems so final, doesn't it? I, I won't do this to spare you, but I could describe in detail several times where I remember hearing the news of someone dying. I could tell you where I was, what I was doing, what time it was, and, and quite honestly, as a human being, it haunts me. The sadness and the grief, the worry, the anxiety it causes. You start thinking, who's next? The concern for other loved ones. And if we let it, it shakes our faith, which is not good. And that's why we have John 11 in our Bibles. It's at this news of Lazarus dying that all the people, or of all the people, Thomas, doubting Thomas, called the twin, speaks up. He said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Very optimistic, Thomas was. <laughs> now the him there isn't Lazarus, he's talking about Jesus. 
Fine, if Jesus is going to go and he's going to get killed, let's go with him. For Thomas, it seems that death ends all hope, which makes sense later on in the Gospel of John when it's Thomas who flat out said, I refuse to believe unless I see him and put my hands in the holes. That's why he couldn't believe later on. So let me come to verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. But John goes on. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Again, four days, long enough to leave any doubt that Jesus was truly, that Lazarus was truly dead. In verse 20, going forward, we get this exchange between Martha and Jesus when Jesus shows up. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. How often have we said that? If God was real and he really cared about me and what was going on, he wouldn't have let this happen. Then Martha says, even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. It's a very curious response that Martha gives here because you don't know if she's frustrated or sad or angry or still faithful, you don't really know. It's probably a combination of all of them. Again, remember, when we have this written down, Martha didn't. She didn't know that Jesus had deliberately stayed away for two additional days. She didn't know that from what we read. Thus, I don't think her, her words should be taken as a rebuke to Jesus. She isn't blaming Jesus. Rather, I think they are words of faith here. Jesus, I know if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. And so the rest of what she says is often misinterpreted. Even now she says, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I want to make it clear, I don't think she's asking here for Jesus to bring her brother back to life. More to the point, she's confessing that her faith in Jesus has not wavered, and she believes that Jesus and the Father are one. And so then we go to verses 23 through 24, and we become very, very practical. Listen to the rest of the exchange. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. It almost seems as if Jesus is offering the same type of consolation that we hear at so many funerals. He's in a better place. He's free from pain. The last day's coming, we hear that. You will see your loved one again. But here Martha reveals her orthodoxy, doesn't she? See, Jesus, Martha, the Jews, the Pharisees, all of them really except the Sadducees, believed in a resurrection on the last day, which is why the Sadducees were Sadducees, because they didn't believe in a resurrection. But friends, while Martha is very orthodox and correct in her doctrine, she missed the point. And I want that to be a lesson for us all. As people of the Word at Southside Bible Church who love our doctrine, and we should, I want you to remember that no doctrine, as much as we love it, no amount of confessing all the right things, can save us from missing the point sometimes. From missing Jesus. There's such a thing in believing the right things to the exclusion of Christ and Jesus is about to show us that very thing. That's what happened to Martha. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Martha confessed she believed in the resurrection on the last day, which is good. And Jesus, with a claim to deity, states, I am the resurrection. He's not merely the cause of the resurrection or the means of the resurrection. He is the resurrection. We've been talking about death and really who can fight it among us. The Bible says it clearly, the soul that sins shall die. It's appointed once for man to die. And he can grip your mind in fear 
because you know that's the, the, the end of human existence, at least in this, in this realm, isn't it? And so when it grips you in fear, where do you go? I've read all 63 volumes of Spurgeon sermons. I've read God in the Dark by Oz Guinness, The Trouble of Malachi by Timothy Rogers. I've had friends late at night praying for me over this. And while they helped, they don't solve the problem. Now, the answer to this problem of death, the one we should turn to, is he who is the resurrection. You go to life. But Jesus doesn't stop there in this claim to divinity, does he? He never lets us stop at his words in the Gospels. You notice that? He never just lets us stop where we are. There's always something more. He puts his words to us. He brings the full weight of his authority to Martha in this moment. And he says this. Do you believe this? Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you, Martha, right there, believe this? And that question is still relevant for us today, isn't it? So he's asking every single one of us in this room, do you believe this? He says he is both the resurrection and the life. I want you to see now what Jesus does with it. He says, I am the resurrection. That is, the one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. So death cannot stop him. That's his point. Because if they die, they will live. That's the resurrection part. Then he says, I am the life. That is, everyone who lives and believes in me will never, ever die. So he covers both scenarios. There's no losing situation with Jesus Christ here. That's his point. So Jesus takes Martha from a focus on her abstract truth about resurrection on the last day, which is true, and he puts it on himself. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? All the great I am statements that we've been going through and we have a couple more to do are wonderful. But the question is, do you believe him when he says them? Again, we're not to believe that Jesus is just the source of the resurrection, but the actual resurrection himself. He is the very power of God unto life. Something no mere human has ever managed to do. They can clone in a lab. They can create things. But the one thing that men have found that they cannot do is give the breath of life to anyone. They can take what is already there and they can duplicate, they can resuscitate, but they cannot create. They don't have the power of life. They are not the power of life. Jesus Christ is the power of life. So to believe in the resurrection is to believe in Christ Jesus himself if that believing is done properly. That's why they go hand in hand. That's why you cannot be a true Christian and deny the resurrection because he's saying they're the same thing. So the question is, do you believe this? We have to wrestle with that question. Some of us sooner rather than later. We can't be neutral about that one. And so how does Martha answer? Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Okay, sort of, Martha. I think you get it. Think of it in light of the moment. Her brother had just died, and she confessed the faith, and may we all such do such things in those times. And so the conversation between Martha and Jesus now ended for a time, and we pick back up in verse 28. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. And we all have that kind of faith. When Jesus is asking for us, let's get up and go. And when she heard it, She rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, and there's a reason for that. He was still in the place where Martha had met him. So Jesus uh, basically sends Martha into the the village and the house to get Mary. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, Mary consoling her, saw her rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. So Martha goes back into the village, and she calls her sister. Notice, in private, it says, and told her Jesus was looking for her. And we can only assume that Jesus wanted to have a conversation 
with Mary the same way that he did with Martha. But notice we also get the details that not only did Mary go out quickly to meet him, the Jews who were there followed. And that becomes really important in the text here in a moment. And when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing her sister said. If you had been here, he would be alive. Now Mary responds more emotionally than her sister did, but she proclaims the same faith, the same truth. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And so the scene is starting to turn chaotic. Mary was supposed to come by herself. And they had professional mourners. What a job. To go with family who, who was mourning someone. And it was your job to weep and to wail with them and to mourn. And so they come. They see that Mary is going out maybe to the, the tomb, and they follow. And we read this, that Jesus sees Mary weeping, and he looks around and sees the Jews coming with her. And most people think that Jesus was sad because he saw all these people weeping. But that isn't what the words mean there. The sadness would come in just a minute, but now this phrase, deeply moved, means something closer to indignant. He was upset, presumably by the large crowd that had followed Mary out, presumably by what sin had done to his world. He had called Mary privately, at least that's the impression we get when Martha went into her. So why was he indignant or greatly outraged? Again, I think it's a combination of the private conversation he was wanting to have, and it was ruined by everyone coming out with her. And second, he was angry with sin that had produced such death and grief and weeping. Not only was it a sad thing, it was a chaotic thing. Look what sin has done. He is the resurrection and the life, and all around him he's surrounded by death. Immediately after this reaction, he says this in verse 34. Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Now that one is Jesus weeping. When Jesus weeps, it's not out of despair, mind you, but from being deeply moved by the sin and the death and the love of his friend. And the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could, he not, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Yes. Of course he could, but that wasn't the point. So then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead for four days. And there's that time frame mentioned again. Don't do that, it's going to stink. How quickly one forgets. Didn't Jesus just tell her, your brother will rise again? And she's worried about the smell? She's already confessed her faith. So one wonders why she would question the instruction here. The soul of the Spirit is gone. It's been four days. And the only thing hovering around Lazarus at this point is the stench of death. But Jesus said, remember, that he was coming to wake Lazarus up. As we read in verse 40, Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So he took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. He wants the motive here, so that people would believe in him. I want you to notice the similarity here of what Jesus says to what Martha said earlier. When Jesus asked Martha if she believed, her response was, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. And Jesus here indicates that he prays loudly to the Father so that those who heard would believe also that the Father had sent him. He wants those who heard him to have the same reaction that Martha did earlier. I believe you're the Son of God. So we have to think of the signs not as ends unto themselves. When we read the miracles in the Gospel of John and other places in the Bible, we don't read them and say, well, what a neat thing that was that Jesus did that. Now what they do is they authenticate the great I am statements 
And we see that from his plan early on when he stayed away for two days. He wasn't raising Lazarus from the dead because he wept or because Mary and Martha were sorrowful, but rather so they would know that he is the true son of God. I'm not giving your brother back to you because you're sad about it. I'm giving your brother back to you so that you would believe I am who I said I am. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. And so the greatest sign of miracle in the Gospels, apart from his own resurrection, was now complete. He who was the resurrection and the life demonstrated right before their eyes that very claim. And here's the neat thing about the Gospel. He who raised Lazarus from the dead is alive today. He's still the resurrection and the life. This isn't isolated to Mary and Martha back in the Gospel of John. And we read about it and say, oh, what a neat story that is. And it doesn't matter to our lives right now. He's the resurrection of the life then. He's the resurrection of the life now. And he will always be the resurrection of the life. That's his point. This is what Hebrews says. He who has become a priest, Jesus, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. So when Jesus died and was raised again, he proved again he's the resurrection of life, and now death has no more power over him. That's it. Death lost. He still intercedes and raises people from the dead in a manner of speaking. Listen to what Paul writes to the Ephesians. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when Jesus raises people from the dead, specifically Lazarus, he's doing it to point you to a greater reality that it's your soul that needs it too. <coughs> if you have believed in the one who has declared, I am the resurrection and the life, then this is true of you. You are united to him. That's why that little word, believe in him. That little word, in, right? into. That means if you are united with Christ, you take part in the resurrection. That when illness and cancer and whatever else that goes on in this world has destroyed the body, that is not the end. The curse that was in the garden that Nick read for us has been reversed. As Spurgeon said, Christ rolled away the stone over your heart and will one day roll away the stone over your grave. Genuine faith in Christ and sense brings people into Christ as they rest in and become united with him. And if united with Christ, and we say it at every baptism that we do here, united with him in death, we too are raised to walk in newness of life. You want to know what baptism means? That's what it means. That one day you will live again. And so we cry out with Paul this morning. We say this, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And how? Because there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The sin that we've been talking about has no more swaying power over you. Finality. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. When he went into the tomb, he took sin with him. And when he came out, he left it there. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. So it's connected. 
If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And that's the point. We don't fear death anymore. Because Jesus beat it. It doesn't grip our minds when we get bad diagnosis anymore. Because he's the resurrection. And it's my prayer this morning that as you think about this, and maybe you've never even thought about this, maybe it's just so far off in your mind that, you know, one day, yeah, I'm sure that'll happen, and I'm young, and, you know, I'm in good health, and whatever it is that you want to delude yourselves into thinking that you're okay, I want you to think about that. Not to be fearful of it, but to know that you are united in Christ who is the resurrection so that when that body is torn down, that is not the end. Right here, right now, Jesus is alive. Right now. And he promises that one day he will raise the dead. And he showed us in John 11 that he'll do what he said. But first there has to be the spiritual resurrection. Because all the dead will be raised in the resurrection. Someone to honor, someone to dishonor. So the spiritual resurrection is key in what I'm telling you this morning. You want to be raised to life in Christ, then you must be in Christ. That's the condition. So again, as my prayer that as we think about John 11 here and we read these words of Paul that death no longer has victory, that we would take that and it would fill our minds and our hearts that when we face this subject of death, we never do it apart from the fact that Jesus is the resurrection. There has to be the other side. There has to be the other side. We live because Jesus lives. Paul said if that is not the case, we should be pitied among all people in the world. What are we doing here if that is not the case? For some morality, to get some good doctrine, great, what good is it going to do you in the end if Jesus has not been raised from the dead? None. None. So come to him. Turn to him. When he asks you, do you believe this? Answer that question today. He requires it of you. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And I pray that your answer is yes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for telling us what the problem is and more so telling us what the remedy is. We thank you that you have left this story recorded in John 11 that we might know and believe and have life in you, in your name. And Father, I pray for all those who are sick, for all those who are mourning the loss of a loved one, for any who have wrestled with the subject and it keeps them in fear in the middle of the night. I pray that you would use this to comfort them this morning, that our focus would not be on the sin, though we take it seriously, but it would be on the life that is found in your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray these things in his name, who is faithful, who is a Savior, and who is alive. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.